trust in all of that. Well, we've, we've never had a, a problem talking about things. We could talk for a long time. We do. This is Devin Foley, CEO of Charlemagne Institute, publisher of Intellectual Takeout and Chronicles Magazine. I am here today for the first Tuesday's conservative countdown to the election, co-hosted by Alpha News and Charlemagne Institute. Uh, thanks so much for joining us on this evening. We've got a fantastic guest for us. It is John Gilmore who is an author and a political and cultural commentator. Uh, we'll be jumping into uh, some of the issues, the, the, the strange sense everyone has out there of living in a culture and a society that doesn't seem real all the time and how we are caught up in this and how we can find our way out of it. John, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Devin. It's good to be back again uh, with you. A long time ago, when I had an active podcast called Gilmore and Guests, I had you as a guest, and it was uh, it was quite fun and revealing, intellectually challenging. And I'm looking forward to being on the other side of the, I guess, computer monitor, uh, and talking to you about a lot of different things that are going on. I think you're right. When you put them all together, there is. Uh, a surrealness to to live life. Um, sometimes it's Groundhog Day, uh, especially with respect to the election, as you referenced. In October, I'm reliving my October of 2016. You know, the last thing I thought that uh, the cathedral, and we can talk about that term in, in a bit, the last thing I thought the cathedral would do was rerun the 2016 playbook, uh, but in many important ways, they are. Thank you. It, it, it does. It seems to me that they, and I wonder if it is because, you know, what I've noticed over the years is that the modern left, which dominates media, is not the same as the Marxists of old. The Marxists of old actually studied Western civilization. They read deeply uh, of its literature and philosophical debates, and they understood intimately what they were attempting to tear down. But it seems to me that the modern left in America, due to the nature of the ideology, that anything in the past is barbaric, patriar patriarchal, racist, all of these things, that they, they have ended up being in their own echo chamber and kind of drinking their own Kool-Aid, thinking that what they like, what they don't like, what they're talking about is, are the same things that animate the rest of America. And uh, again, 2016, we saw that on full, full display of it. So tell us more about what you're seeing uh, with this election season. Well, it's, it's a number of things. And I, I think I want to sort of start, if, if you don't mind, Devin, by saying that a, a lot of what conservatives this cycle are doing, and in between 16 and 20, uh, has proven to my viewpoint to be uh, fairly useless. And uh, there, there's an expression on Twitter, I'm a Twitter guy, maybe too much. I can, you know, maybe if Hazelton opens for uh, a Twitter connection <laughs> I can visit or something. Uh, I don't like Facebook, uh, each to their own, but there's a phrase when somebody is assessing something on Twitter and another person uh, categorizes it as cope. And, and that's what it is. It's just cope. Um, conservatives, are involving themselves in organizations and groups that have demonstrably failed. I'll never get invited to First Tuesdays again or any of these. This is my first Zoom meeting, ladies and gentlemen, for what it's worth. I thought I'd you know, successfully go through the pandemic uh, without it, but this is, uh, if there's anything worthwhile, this, this is the one to, to be with you, Devin, in Zoom. But, a lot of people like uh, CPAC, I get it. Um, I'm old enough to remember when it first started, it wasn't any great shakes. It was a couple of thousand younger kids coming to DC to bluntly uh, get drunk and maybe get laid. Okay, great kids, we get it, ha ha, it's fun and so on. Then it got monetized and it's run by, uh, I think a really odious couple, Matt Schlapp and his wife, Mercedes. And they've monetized it. And it's part of Conservative Inc., Conservative Incorporated. 
And they're just another set of gatekeepers only on our side. And I, I think they're relatively useless. My, my question to people, and I'm a boomer, but uh, someone once described Steve Saylor as an apostate boomer. And I like that term, so I'll, I'll apply it to myself. Um, I'm in the demographic, but I'm pretty sure I don't have the mindset. And depressingly enough, Devin, I've met Minnesota young men and women in their 20s and 30s and they've got nothing but a boomer mindset. You're not gonna save the future with that. The thinking has to be quite different. And so I don't mean to offend. Um, I don't mean to be obnoxious. My yeah. friends say, there's, you, don't, you, know, you don't need to mean, you just come off that way, but I'm really not trying to um, be provocative for its own sake or to be a contrarian for its own sake. We, we know those types, it, it's tiresome. You know, water is wet. Well, not always, there could be, you know, uh, a gas or a solid, okay, thank you. But with CPAC, take Trump out of it, who, by the way, they didn't let him speak in 2016. I had Hello. forgotten about that. You're yeah. so right. Yeah. I, well, and then you have National Review uh, doing its cover piece against Trump, yeah. uh, which was shocking. And uh, I think has had some, some somewhat serious uh, ramifications for the magazine and within the conservative world. Um, I think so too, and, and deservedly so. They fired, I think it was John Derbyshire, which prompted Ann Coulter, um, who's on again and off again with Trump. That's fine. I, I, I'm not really interested in Ann Coulter, although she did write the book, Adios America, that as I understand it, Trump received in galleys, and he was off to the races on the immigration issue. Um, and immigration is something that's been oddly missing this election cycle. There's three weeks two weeks and six days, uh, and we'll see if it is emphasized in the president's uh, flying around the country and in his rallies. But my point is that the, the, the typical conservative organizations conserve nothing. You take Trump out of it, what has CPAC preserved? Nothing. Um, I don't know, was it a year ago I went to uh, Bill Guan, my former partner in crime with a podcast, it used to be called Gilmore and Guan. Um, he calls it before times, you know, before, before 2020 and this, uh, and this pandemic, which is a hoax, not the virus, but the lockdowns and the masks are a hoax. And, and we're finally getting around to understanding that. But after- so wait, John, you're telling me that this doesn't keep me safe? I don't think that's gonna block a 0.1 uh micron virus no no but but, but you Who know knew? I, well it, it's so odd with the left because no matter what they touch number one they ruin and number two it's it's completely instrumentalized in obtaining and keeping power and we've seen on we've seen that i, I think in 2020 in in bold technicolor you know uh sometimes David Lynch saturation cover coverage. It, it's been astonishing. Yeah, and with that then, you know, as you say, immigration hasn't really been a topic when it was front and center in 2016. Is it because people are coming to terms with the reality uh, that a large chunk of the electorate wants power at all costs? And it is a will to power moment. I mean, just the very act of Portland with 140 days or whatever it is of will to power, rioting, destruction, everything else. And then, of course, all across the country. Tell me, tell me more as far as uh, what, what you're thinking on that. Well, with immigration, um, what, what you said, I agree with Deb, and I think that could be applied across the, the waterfront, uh, so to speak. Uh, with immigration, I think. Uh, a lot of things that the president could have done was uh, watered down or nullified uh, by Jared Kushner. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of Jared. I'm not a fan of Ivanka. I think they've undermined uh, a lot of his America First programs. And that's why the president kind of likes Tucker and he kind of doesn't because Tucker, who I think is the single most important uh, person in mainstream media, it's the only thing that I watch uh, on Fox and, you know, people can choose their media diet. But if, if you're not watching Tucker Carlson, you don't have 
uh, you're, you're not availing yourself of the most uh, cogent take uh, on the zeitgeist and on the influences that, that are shaping our, our current world and our current predicament. Uh, this is probably a natural segue to talk about the cathedral. And I write about this at minnesotaconservatives.org, Minnesota spelled out, uh, conservativesplural.org. So easy, even a boomer could find it. Um, I joke, I joke. Uh, and, and I explain a few terms that I think do a far better job of informing people about what's going on. And again, not to be uh, a nag, but you're not going to get it from CPAC. Uh, you're not going to get it from another five minute, you know, Prager University uh, thing. And I'm glad CPAC exists. Don't get me wrong. I, I, this isn't jealousy in any way at all. The more the merrier, the better. It's just that I see, especially boomers, and let's be expansive, 45 and older. They think, you know, um, that's really the berries and it moves the needle and it just doesn't, you know, uh, Prager is in federal court suing because he's being, you know, uh, shut down and, and censored and so forth. And we we're, we're being governed against ourselves. And I think that's been apparent in the extreme in 2020. Now, why is that? Is it true that democracy is use, useless? No, but the, the front lines have changed and the cathedral was invented by someone who used to write under a pen name of Moldbug. His real name is uh, Curtis Yarvin. And he defines the cathedral in, in the most basic definition. There's a more expansive one, which I think is helpful to read if people do want to go to minnesotaconservatives.org. Uh, I make exactly no money there. I have no ads. Uh, I, you know, I don't know how to do the monetization thing. You so know. you're conservative, but you don't have ink behind you. Yeah, I don't. I don't have PayPal. I don't have Good a PayPal know. account. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's sort of like you get what you pay for, I guess. In any event, the cathedral, um, Moldbug said, consists of, of two elements. One is the universities, and they formulate public policies. And the second part is corporate media. And they, he's borrowing from Noam Chomsky here, they manufacture consent. And he says, you know, the, the two of them are as subtle as a punch in the mouth. And that's why you get the same narrative. If you go onto social media, you can see what the narrative has been set uh, by the cathedral. It's uh, one reason why we never talk in the Twin Cities at least, when it comes to crime, just who's doing all the crime? Well, if it were white people, I'll go there, uh, you'd hear a lot about it. Hope you're sitting down. It's mostly not, so you don't hear anything about it. And people are afraid to state what is obvious in, in front of them. And I don't mean in uh, antagonistic, terrible terms, but, but honesty is honesty. And, and we on the right are, are kept in check. They try to keep us in check by name calling. And that's very effective, especially among Minnesota Republicans and conservatives. I'm not a Republican, I'm a conservative, and I'm, I'm veering toward being a you know, full-blown neo-reactionary, what the hell? Um, you know, it's just kind of crazy sometimes, but I, I get old myself and say, no, you know, get a grip, y'all more. But you, you won't be able to get certain truths articulated by the cathedral because it's the antithesis to the narratives that they want to drive. And your comment about Black Lives Matter is interesting in several regards. Racial division is a tool that they're exploiting uh, to foment division uh, in order to stay in power or attain more of it. It's also, and this isn't my original observation, but I think it is a, a good insight. If you can get a population distracted about race, and if you treat people as best you can, green, orange, yellow, black, white, name it, any, any shade of God's children, then that's, all, that's the best that you can do. But that's not, that's not their goal. Their goal isn't racial harmony, it's disharmony. And you see people who have that as an explicit uh, agenda being promoted by the cathedral. But Black Lives Matter and the Marxist origins and all of that um, is interesting. It keeps us from talking about economics and class. 
to your point, the traditional Marxists would talk about class and would talk about economics. It seems to me that's been replaced virtually wholesale by these other woke tropes. And so when we, we look at current conditions, we don't talk, it, it's okay, I think, I think, it's, I think it's essential for conservatives to talk about economic inequality. Years ago on Twitter, I, I, I agreed with uh, Representative Ryan Winkler. He's now the majority leader in the Minnesota House of Representatives because he would talk about wage stagnation. And I thought, my God, he's right. Oh you yeah, know, I was right. telling this to my kids. You know, I told them, I said, look, you know, you're when my son works uh, at a Panera Bread and I think he makes $12 an hour, $13 an hour, somewhere around there. And I told him, I said, look, when I was a kid in the 90s, I was a lifeguard and I made $10 an hour. And you, so you're only making about 20% more than me. But I said, here's the thing. With that $10, I could buy five gallons of gas and hit McDonald's twice. Yep. And, uh, you know, $10 now, well, it's five gallons of gas and that's it. And, and, and it really helps people understand uh, purchasing power matters. It really does. And we need to talk about that. It does. And you've got a Fed that tries to aim for a certain amount of inflation. You know, it, oh, it, it, 2%. It'll be magical. Yeah, magical. Like, like the mask. It's, only, it's an economic mask. It, it does miracles, Devin. You know, just, just trust us. You know, have, have, we, have we gotten anything wrong so far? Sure. No, not at all. I believe the, the Fed's, part of the Fed's duty is to, uh, you know, ensure economic tranquility. And uh, they failed miserably at that. It, it, it's an impossible task, first of all. But well, the and, history and, of the Fed in the 20th century would show that they failed. Well, and, and to, to telescope out, there's an anesthetizing effect on, on the culture and on the population. Uh, or suppose it's, it's Amazon Prime Day. How many hundreds did you spend, Devin? I mean, the more you, the more you buy, the more complete person you are. And I know it's easy to critique consumerism. It's been done. We don't want to sound like leftists here. But there is something to be said for the advent of cheap excrement from China as the goal. We hollowed out our manufacturing base so we could get cheap crap from China. I don't think it's made anybody any happier. And in the meantime, you have uh, deaths of despair is the term of art. You have uh, hollowed out Midwest. You have, it, it's time for a, a renaissance of that old song. What's it all about, Elfie? because people chase after these ephemeral things. And I think it was Gertrude Stein who said it about Oakland, there's no there there. And you touched on Christianity with Katie, which I thought was um, interesting and exciting. And I'm not particularly religious myself. I'm not an atheist. I don't need anyone to, please, please, I'm not an atheist. But culturally, I'm Irish Catholic. I think the, the goal of these various forces, the cathedral, which we've touched on, I can explain bio-Leninism, and the third term that I think is really helpful for people to understand current times is anarcho-tyranny. Uh, they, they combine um, to decimate all that we've held to be true and dear. Uh, they uh, erode, like being dipped in an acid bath, those things we would refer to as tradition, they're mocked and belittled. Uh, men are encouraged uh, to be effeminate and it doesn't mean you have to have, you know, and I'm not talking about you know, 18 inch biceps. Um, in some ways, even now, com uh, well, compared, compared to now, even Woody Allen comes across as masculine. He was trying to get the girl you know, he, he wanted to score. It was sort of base, but newsflash, men are base and, and, and women marginally less so. What I'm trying to drive at though, is that there, there's been this uh, consistent and, and wide ranging attack on everything that's normal. And right. cling to normal is to be accused of, you name it, a phobia or an ism. 
And it's all, it's all BS. And if people would get over their fear of being called names, at least in Minnesota, I can't speak to the rest of the country, although it may apply depending upon where we're looking at. All they have is name calling. When, when you're called names, they're out of ideas, they're out of arguments, and they're trying to shut you the hell up. Well, guess what? I've been called every name in the book. I'm not a hero. I'm not looking for a medal. But when when you stand up to the name calling and say, yeah, really, I don't think so, uh, then they don't know what to do. Some of them start at the top of the list again and think, well, maybe if I just call him the following 10 names one more time with feeling, you know, he'll run away. Um, and, and there was a recent example uh, with a phenomenon, uh, Bronze Age pervert which is um, an anonymous writer and, and persona. And he wrote a book called Bronze Age Mindset. I wrote about it in November. If you go to minnesotaconservatives.org and on the right is an archive, just uncollapse the years and go to November of 2019. I wrote uh, a primer for Minnesotans because it was something of a thing on the right. And no less than Michael Anton who wrote the Flight 93 election article, if you remember back to 16, I know you do, Devin, and he's at the Claremont Review of Books, um, reviewed it. And it was pretty amazing that it had penetrated that much of, uh, and I don't mean this in a dismissive way, uh, the respectable right. It, it had been, to, to my way of thinking, mainstreamed and, and given legitimacy, as opposed to sort of this, this fringe thing. Well, about a month ago, Minnesota Reformer, which is a Twin Cities pop-up based news outlet, it's basically Soros money and he's put about 10 of them in different swing states, um, run by a handful of uber liberals and they're vicious attack dogs and their whole raison d'etre is, is to take out any threats that they see on the right. And then secondarily, I think, to take Twin Cities media and to try, the, to try to pull them even further left. And if you don't think they can go further left, we should talk because it's just not true. They can. They went, after, they went after my friend, Senator Roger Chamberlain because he talked about Bronze Age mindset. He talked about Bronze Age pervert, liked a tweet of his or retweeted him. And so they were all hot to try. Literally, Aaron May Quaid, Ryan Winkler, others. Here's a man who is a, a real model of a human being and a known quantity in Minnesota politics. And they're trying to convince everyone that suddenly, yes, he's a Nazi, he's a white supremacist, he's all these sorts of things. That's enough to make a cat laugh as Christopher Hitchens used to say. And I stood up to it on Twitter. Um, Roger said nothing. I don't know where he got that advice. Roger said nothing, a couple of us went to bat. And, you know, it's sort of like a digital playground. You know, we beat the snot out of them. We just mocked them. It's like, this is a mainstream. You can get it on Amazon. You can talk about whether he's full of it. You can talk about this aspect. My point is, Republicans and conservatives need to stand up for each other. And out of respect for you, I won't use another example. But I'm, I'm, I, I'm glad... I'm, I'm, I'm glad she found a home where she did, because that's another example, Devin, where it's like somebody on the left will point at someone on the right and say, I don't know, kind of sketchy. And everyone else on the right too often says, oh my God, hair on fire, dresses over our heads. And we do the rest of their work in canceling them. It's shameful and it needs to stop. Exactly. And, uh, you know, I've seen this personally when we were running uh, the Better Ed Project. And uh, this was a little while back. It was focused primarily on uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul Public Schools, but also public schools in the metro uh, in general as it expanded. And we dropped, this would have been uh, after the first round of Black Lives Matter activity, we actually dropped a postcard. On one side, it was black with the hashtag Black Lives Matter. On the back, we had a uh, reading proficiency, if I remember correctly, for African-American students, which was awful. Over a 14-year period, I think the average was about a third uh, had, were proficient in reading. And that's not the highest mark. That's just 
that's the baseline where you need to be. And a local reporter, uh, Aaron Rupar, gave me a call <laughs> about this piece because everything, of course, is blowing up. Uh, Nikima Levy Pounds is going after us, all of these different things. And so he calls. I, uh, you know, let him go into voicemail and then I call him back once I'm set up. And the just so people understand how this works, he opened up. There wasn't a high boo nothing. It was you dropped a postcard that has Black Lives Matter hashtag on it. Uh, Nikimi Levy Pounds and others say that you are misappropriating the hashtag. Uh, and this is a display of your racism as a bunch of white guys doing this work. What do you have to say to that? Don't you think you're a racist? Wow. Uh, but instead of just folding, I just asked him, I said, Who, what color was Harriet Beecher Stowe? And it was sort of the, wait, what, what? And uh, I said, no, really, what color is Harriet Beecher Stowe? Aaron isn't, I, I'm sure he didn't know the name nor the book. Maybe he heard the book, but he doesn't know the author, not the brightest guy. Well, well, I was shocked. So I said, look, the interview is over unless you Google it. And I know you're sitting in front of your, uh, in front of your computer. They said, do it, otherwise, you know. And so I hear the clack, clack, clack. And then I hear silence. And I said, well, what color is she? Uh, uh, she's white. Oh, so a white woman can write about the, pl the plight of uh, black slaves in America and change the world. I said, if that's acceptable, which I think it perfectly is, then by all means, we as white people are more than entitled to care about how black kids are doing in public schools especially in Minneapolis, where you're spending anywhere from twenty-three dollars to $25,000 a year on each student. And we can use that money better. But to your point, it, it really is true. If you don't wilt right out of the gate, there's not much left that they have. You know, again, we're not dealing with the old school Marxists who actually had a whole lot more uh, coming at you to deconstruct your beliefs and put they you into did. a corner. To their credit, they did, yeah. No, they really did. And, no, uh, the you know, the thing of racism, and I got that card, I was tickled, and I, I thought to myself, well, I wonder if you know what is it, the fan? Because <laughs> I probably, you know, the first person who got it. The, what, what people on the right, wherever you find yourself, a traditional Republican, a conservative, a libertarian, neo reactionary, whatever. Uh, when you're being called a name, you're talking about something that is desperately needed to be discussed. And the name calling is designed purely to silence you. And the idea is only blacks can care about blacks. And that is a rancid idea. Are Truly. we supposed are we supposed to be indifferent to our fellow Americans, and I'm using the word deliberately, being slaughtered, slaughtered weekend in and weekend out in Chicago and in other major urban areas in this country? Is there, is there a sort of indifference that, that is virtuous? No, it, it's so perverted. The gaslighting is so intense, the inversion so complete that caring about someone who doesn't share one of your immutable characteristics is itself transgressive and an act of racism. Well, it, it's, no, you couldn't be more right. And the other part of it though, and, and this is where I'm worried and why I was uh, enjoying, you know, the description of the cathedral, but also even getting into anarcho-tyranny and bio-Leninism and all of this is by not fighting the culture war and not fighting the long fight as conservatives haven't done. We poured our money into political candidates and white papers and yielded the field of education, entertainment, literature, everything down the road. Yep. And what I'm very worried about though now is that an accusation of racism uh, can destroy someone's livelihood, their friends, all of this. You know, the, the, the woke ideology has it is not just infested in, you know, the ivory tower or in Hollywood or in media. It is Park Avenue. It is advertising. It is 
uh, I mean, you go through the list, you, uh, HR at corporations, now you're getting laws passed, all of these things. And they now put in place the tools to be able to really destroy you if you get out of line. Well, I, I, I agree with you to a point, Devin, and then I have to strongly disagree because I think there was a time recently where an accusation of racism, because it wasn't made so frequently, mm. had power in effect. I'm sorry, if you're on the right and you haven't been called a racist yet, you're not helping. It, it's, it's, you know, a badge of honor practically. Oh yeah. And, and, well, uh, and the other thing too is you see this uh, this ideology where it's uh, you know the new moral order is being nice in addition to not being having a phobia of any manner of things or isms, and even that is twisted when you think about it. You know, we're supposed to be nice or be segregated by not paying attention to the disaster taking place in urban America. I mean, we did a FOIA request. 90%, 90% of African American children, native born, so separating out the smallest, were born out of wedlock in St. Paul. It's 87% in Minneapolis. That is a complete and utter disaster. And yet you're racist if you want to talk about that, or patriarchal if you want to talk about it. I'll yet do you one better. Floatsum and jetsum is yeah. everywhere. I'll do you one better. Somehow white people are responsible for it. And you know what? I'm just going to take a pass on that nonsense. You know what? You people get it together. I can't help you. I don't know how to. You're, you're, you're not going to listen to me because I'm, I, I'm white. Well, then fine. But in the meantime, I get to notice your kids can't read. They can't do simple math. They're unemployable. And, and the amount of violent crime committed by Blacks is astronomical, flat out. I'm not making it up. Although no, no. The, no you can look at uh, you know some of the, of the data out of Chicago is you have over 80% of murders are uh, black Chicagoans. Black on black. But 80% of those committing the murder are also black Chicagoans. Well, I mean- But, but what it, they also do, Devin, it's, um, you, you have to be on your toes. That's what I like about Twitter. If you get something wrong, man, you're instantly corrected. You really are. And that's, it's a kill box. And a lot of narratives uh, that were attempted to be born and generated and, and get running uh, have been killed, you know, uh, at the start on Twitter. It's, it's a mixed bag for sure. One of the reporters for the Star Tribune, um, I think he called me a dumbass. I was pretty wounded. Uh, I must have gone deep. It did. It, it did. did. I knew it. Yeah. When Were you, you on convalescence for a while? But you can insult yourself way better than these midwits. You know, it's, <laughs> is that all you got? But he, what, what he did, though, and this is, this is very typical of the regressive left. Uh, Gilmore, you're using FBI crime statistics. We're going to try to invalidate them, delegitimize them. Why? Because they're giving the wrong narrative that the problem in our culture is almost preeminently and uniquely and wickedly the fault of white people. I'm done. If, if, if Blacks can take ethnic pride, Hispanics and Asians, Native Americans, um, uh, subcontinent uh, Indians, and they should, then white people can too. Except, oh wait, that's when you get called a racist and a white supremacist. That works on a lot of white people. It doesn't work on me. No, no. That, that uh, you know, hunt. the one I'm watching for is, and this will, if they, if the left and the woke side does this, and you're already seeing uh, tells and that it, they're going that way and some test balloons going up. But when the attack comes on white women, that will be a very interesting time. Because right now, white guys like us are just being hung out to dry, you know, and there's no one is going to come to your rescue. You're trying to do your best. You, you know, you give a good chunk of your life and stress and put yourself out there in the gladiator arena to fight for better schools and fight for better education, for fight for whole families, 
uh, not just for white kids, but especially for young black kids. And you're the bad guy. And it's just, it is absolutely disgusting. But if and when white women find themselves on the receiving end of this, that will be an interesting catalyst. And we, it could go in any number of different ways. Starting, yes. Um, Scott Greer, who's on uh, Twitter, Scott Greer coined the term AWFLs, awfuls, affluent white female liberals. They're the overwhelming drivers of this. Um, mostly single, kind of the box wine ants with maybe a cat or two, and I love animals. Um, I've got cats because dogs are too much work when I travel and I used to travel. I'll get back to you in 2021, see you know, if I can go somewhere. But Devin, that, that really is the driver for this cost-free to them virtue signaling, which really, if I can sort of encapsulate what we're saying, they are just wanting to be eaten last. And it's already mm. happening. Um, even Betsy Hodges, the failed ridiculous mayor of Minneapolis, toward the end of her painful tenure, was accused of not being sufficiently woke. And she's married to a black man. That, that doesn't save you, Betsy. And, and you'll see various cultural talentless figures on the left get their turn in the barrel. So I think that's increasing because it's, it's um, they, they, they're, they're running out of targets. You know, white oh. man, boring, we've done it. Now right. who's next? And, and the overriding, the label is white. Well, you, you, you've you gone to town on white men. Nobody defends them. Hopefully we've convinced everyone that they're the spawn of the devil. And you know these people who think I'm gonna put a Black Lives Matter sign in my yard or all are welcome here. Yeah, it, it's, it's gonna be sort of a, a, a terrible and painful denouement for them, but, it, but it's coming. I think we've already, seen it and that should give people on the on the right side of the political spectrum hope that if you just keep fighting um there can be some progress even if it's slowing the advance of this cultural revolution i never thought i'd live to see statues torn down i never thought i'd live to see uh the the decimation of professional sports which men and women like to enjoy just for, I know it's a cliche, the thrill of the game. Mm -hmm. The Freedom. thrill of the game and an yeah. escape the from the yeah. drudgery of life. The same, the same reason we tune in every four years, pick your favorite Olympic sport, and there it is. And it's it's a celebration yeah. of the body. Um, that's one of Bronze Age perverts thing, is that we've been divorced from our body. We're kind of soy boys. Um, we're, we're weak. We're insipid. Um, you know, and... And, and, and the straight men end up acting more traditionally gay than, than the gay sometimes. It, it's head spinning. Well, it's decadence. Um, We've been it, consumed it, it, with decadence it, it, it and, is, it's and pursuing comfort. Uh, it's degeneracy. And, and if you haven't noticed, and they've been doing this for a while, maybe people are just waking up. Welcome. I don't mean to chastise people who are just starting to figure this out because there's a lot of red pills in this discussion. And a red pill means that you help see reality as it really is, rather than this illusion of everything's hunky-dory and fine. And just to continue the color scheme, a black pill is like bad news. Like Trump losing would be the blackest of pills, okay? A white pill would be like, I don't know, Amy Coney Barrett getting you know to the Supreme Court and so forth. But when people get red pilled, it doesn't matter how long you haven't been that way. You're here now, join forces and understand what's going on. For a long time, they've been coming for our children and that time has arrived. And I'm sorry to make people's stomach, stomachs turn, but it's straight up pedophilia. And we saw that several years ago when the left and parts of the cathedral were saying, you know, it's really just an orientation that they can't control. They mean no harm. It, it's, it's, it, it's an oxymoron on its face. They say, well, unacted upon. Unfortunately, there aren't, it, it's kind of disgusting, frankly. It's really deep. Well, it, cuties, it, though, there's, there's no, it's there's now no. wide open. 
there you, you know, go. And as my wife says, I said, you know, I haven't watched it. I no, read I about it. I couldn't and I saw it. one picture of the girls, and yep. I have three daughters. Yep. And I, I was just revolted seeing yep. that those. And then my wife said, "Oh yeah, there were six hundred or you know kids auditioning for that." I don't even want to know what went on uh, with the auditions and the parties and all of the other things that go along with that world. We are, to your point, you know, it's, it's, it's as if, you know, one of the things that I try and tell people is I said, you know, we're, we are transitioning from the modern age to the postmodern age. And the, the boomers are the last of the postmoderns, the last to hold on to there's an objective reality and reason we can use it to fig pursue truth. The postmodern is simply flipping everything on its head. Nothing is real, but everything's real to you. Your truth supersedes anybody else's around you. But then we get into the problems of, well, what do I do with this person who has four boxes of uh, you know special privileges checked and this one does? And, you get into this goofy world of intersectionality, all of these things. But at the end, I think, you know, what I, I've taken it that, you know, this postmodernism at its core, which is why the West and Christianity are under attack. I would argue, actually, uh, the reason white men are under attack isn't because we're white. It had nothing to do with that. It's because of what we represent, which is a Christian West. Even though we're doing a terrible job of it, that's what we represent and that's what has to be taken down. And so you end up in this, this awful world of essentially, and, and tell me if you, you agree or not, but people are attempting to be like God. It, it, you know, it's the original sin. Uh, I wanna make the world, the world has to conform to the way I feel and the way I think it should be. I mean, that's right. ideology. Right. Here, we're going to say, right. here are the three tenets, and the world must conform, which, of course, is disastrous and tyrannical well, and it's, it's ends a, in ruins. It's a form of mental illness that's been mainstreamed as normative, and if you object, then you're the one who's, you know, the odd man or woman out. I agree, and I also disagree about the explicitly white point, because hmm. there's, a me more. Of, uh, there's a lot of racial and ethnic animosity toward white people, because, and for a penny, and for a pound, because white people basically created the world in which everyone else lives. You don't think Ilhan, Omar, point. You don't think Ilhan Omar has a seething hatred of white people? I, I, I do, absolutely. Spoiler, she married a white dude. Okay, you figure that one out. I, I do think there is um, an ethno-narcissism. You see it in journalism, in, in the Twin Cities especially. You have to be this kind of person with this ethnicity, and then you can write about this topic. It's all very tedious. Um, but there is a hatred, and, and, and cycling back to the, the Christian foundations and the traditional family, that is still the goal of all of these efforts, the cathedral, bio-Leninism, anarcho-tyranny, critical race theory, intersectionality, is to destroy the traditional family of one man and one woman making the future, having perfect sexual complementariness and bringing new life into the world where it didn't exist before. There's well, no other relationship that can bring the future into existence. And what they don't like is you and your wife, A, having too many kids. You're six. In Coney, yeah, you're in Amy Coney Barrett territory there. And two- But not church fan territory, that's important. And, 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 and two, <laughs> transmitting to them and shaping them in the moral framework that you and your wife believe is optimal for living a life with an eye toward the eternal, a concept which has largely vanished. Today I saw on Twitter, black pill, that the Netherlands is getting ready to roll out, which means they've been planning this, right? Mm -hmm. Euthanasia for children. Ugh. I give up. As, as, uh, as St. Pope John Paul II once said, man has become death, capital D. 
you know, th there's, uh, if people watching these, you might see me twitching a bit. I have 12 years of chronic pain, constant pain in my life. Mm. And you, you can find yourself in some dark places. Mm. But at the end of the day, and this is, I think, the, the, and I talked about it with Katie, the role of Christianity, the role of duty. You know, even in my darkest moments, I realize I have a duty to keep going forward for my wife, for my children, uh, for the betterment of our country, all of these things. And so you, you, you fight. And the other part is, and I'll just, just say this real quickly, is you, we have to teach people how to suffer well. And we're here with John Gilmore. He is an author and uh, a political and cultural commentator, as you probably picked up if you're joining us late. Uh, but we are having a, a very enjoyable discussion that we'll surely see all of us uh, in the gulag uh, soon. So I put it, I put it this way, um, Devin, and people's mileage may vary, God forbid, a variety of opinions. Suffering is either useless or transformative. It's, yep. it, it's your choice. And the transformative, I, I think is, is best with, uh, it's just my particulars, with a transcendent and sublime element to it that, that uh, frequently approaches and then goes past the ineffable, the inexpressible. And, and that is something that's been um, completely taken out of our, our social uh, discourse. And there's an interesting book uh, by Charles Taylor called um, A Secular Age. It's on my bookshelf. It's a good yeah. one. It's thick, yeah. it but it's thick. really worth reading. It is. And, and so you know exactly the, the narrative arc. Yep. And, and uh, I think, um, if it's possible, we're post-postmodern. Mm. In, in our in our acceleration toward uh, decline and division and uh, the atomization of families and oh. traditional social structures. You're you're completely within the atomization already of society, and of course we're seeing all of that uh, difficulties and challenges out there. And you know the the to your point of suffering, you. I'm not, sh it's hard to suffer well if you don't have a sense of the, inter of the eternal, uh, that you, you don't have a sense of there's a purpose to me and there's a purpose to this and I need to, to work through this and actually be refined by it. You know, the answer so often, you'll see it on social media, advertising, all these different places. Uh, and I was just thinking this because a girl in, in the line in front of me at uh, wherever I was, she had this shirt on that said, love yourself. And you see that all over the place. You need to love yourself. You know what's funny? Loving yourself to will actually make you miserable. And that doesn't mean that you don't yeah. take care of yourself. No, no, I understand your point very well. And but it's, it's loving it's, others me. that helps you rise above your own suffering. Well, it's it, it, we've we've inverted everything well it, we're encouraged to do the opposite which is why there's the narcissism and i have to break it to people most of us i include myself at the top of the list just aren't that interesting and quite frequently really aren't that lovable i mean people suck sometimes so we have to oh, try, totally we have to try to become you know um our better angels Let's go back to the 70s when McDonald's introduced You Deserve a Break Today. That's in the way, way back, right? Mm -hmm. I remember Michael Novak sometime five, 10 years later, that came up as a cultural reference. And he said, my grandmother would have no idea what you meant. Oh, she deserved a break today. That's amazing. It's, it's and I believe it. It's small, it, small and anecdotal. But there are oceans and worlds of differences between those two mindsets. And so now all we're encouraged to be is as uh, good a consumer and as uh, mentally unstable as possible 
and to think that the world revolves around us and to, uh, you know, the word microaggressions, it means completely hilarious that we've made so much progress that if someone raises an eyebrow passing you in the hall, you end up in HR, but that's the world that we absolutely live in. I don't think it's sustainable and I don't know what the backlash looks like, but I do think one is coming. No, I, and I, I agree I, with I, you on I, that. I think, um, I think it's gonna start November 3rd. You know, I really do think there's yeah. a backlash. Uh, most of us don't riot. Most of us aren't low impulse. Most of us don't get enraged over perceived slights. And, and we know the difference between good and, good and wrong. Um, good and bad. And well, Americans are a patient people in that regard. And there's a hidden backlash to the overreach and the politicization of the Wuhan virus because we've seen it in ways that we could not imagine. Abortion clinics and liquor stores are open. You can't go to church. You can't go to your synagogue. Oh, okay. That makes perfect sense. That's science. I, I think there's, there's been a slow burn and all people want to do is vote and have those votes counted accurately and timely. And we'll see if I'm right. I mean, I went out on a limb in 16 and said it's Trump and got roundly mocked. And then, you know, November 9th, the day, the, the day dawned on November 9th and people were like, well, he got lucky. Okay. Of course. It, it doesn't mean that I'm gonna be right, but I just don't feel, you know, the Biden win. I feel- no, I'm, I'm getting a different sense of things. The, the energy is building uh, for, for President Trump, whereas there's no energy on the other side, we are uh, getting you know close to the bottom of the hour. And uh, as I kind of figured, we've only touched the cathedral. You had also mentioned bioleninism and anarcho tyranny. I'd actually like to skip to anarcho tyranny. Sure. Uh, it's an important phrase. It was uh, Sam Francis. Uh, it's my understanding is one who coined it. He. He actually wrote for Chronicles Magazine back in the day when he, uh, in the 90s. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful word that really captures a lot of the, the things that we're seeing that are instilling both fear and anger in people all at the same time. So tell us about anarcho-tyranny. Well, and if you haven't read any Sam Francis, um, I'd have to have a contest with Devin to see which of us could recommend him more. But since you have uh, inherited his publication, I'll give you that nod, but an absolutely essential writer and thinker so far ahead of his time, it makes your head spin. And well, like Rush Limbaugh in 2016 actually went back and quoted Sam Francis. Yeah. He said, you know, Sam Francis called yeah. this yeah. middle America revolution that's taking yeah. place and yeah. how it would come together uh, in a coalition for an individual like President Trump. Uh, Anarcho-tyranny can be crystallized by calling to mind the McCloskeys in St. Louis, that couple outside their home who simply were on their lawn, each possessing a, a lawful registered firearm, and they've been prosecuted not once but twice because a narco tyranny gives a pass to the criminal element because they're in line, or aligned rather, with the ruling class, while the middle class, to paint in broad strokes, um, who protect themselves, their family, and their property while obeying the law, are persecuted using the instruments of law itself. You have George Soros, a, a genuinely terrible and wicked man. Um, and no, you're not going to shut me up by criticizing me as an anti-Semite. I don't care if he's Jewish or not. That isn't what I'm criticizing him about. Hello, that's all you have to do. Don't take the bait. But, but Soros has funded in these very under the waterline races of county and state attorneys generals and prosecutors, those who share that mindset. So the, the lawful people are being persecuted. The criminal element is giving a, a pass, is given a pass. The anarchy comes from the criminal element being let go. Look at Portland, their, their 
arrested, they're out on bail, revolving door. That's the oh. key. Yeah, people, if, if, you're, if you really want to be horrified, just uh, go on Twitter and follow Andy Ngo's uh, Twitter feed, N-G-O. And he does a tally quite often with the, uh, you know, the crime mug shots. And every, every day, here are six people. Here is what they were taking place in, which generally includes burning, rioting, destroying things, attacking the police. And then it always says, released without bail. When you see those- Unbelievable, it's infuriating. When you see those mug shots, ladies and gentlemen, that's the best description of bio-Leninism that I could give you. So we've gotten two birds, one stone. Also, I would recommend for people in Minnesota and especially the Twin Cities, uh, the Twitter account, Crime Watch MPLS. And I know the woman, she writes about crime without fear or favor, who did it, what the suspects are, the disposition. And because she doesn't put the gloss on actually who is committing the crime, she's been targeted by Minnesota Reformer and the regressive left in the Twin Cities. She's pretty fearless. Um, I did encourage her when she was my guest about a year ago in June on the Sue Jeffers show, uh, she came on and I said, you know, start a Patreon account, you, you know, just get small money. She's not making money doing this. She's not going to be wealthy like that. But there are people um, in Minnesota who are fighting against a lot of these different things. You're one of them. Kim Crockett is one of them. Um, I'm one of them. There are others, Shelly at Minneapolis Crime Watch. There's a lot of timid people, but they support us. They just don't have uh, the ability to be bulletproof. I work for myself. What am I going to do? Fire myself? You know, and, and once you get called every name in the book, there's, you know, all the fun's gone for me now. I've been called everything. Um, and uh, there are other people who are dealing with the uh, Islamization of Minnesota. I'm glad Katie's coming back next Monday. She's going to be in Blaine, and you can go to American Majority. And, and find out the details there. I hope she goes outside of Minneapolis though, because there are people in St. Cloud who've been really fighting this. And while I'm glad for her support, no offense, Katie, um, they don't need to be told what's going on. They're, 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 they are pretty aware of it, as are people in Faribault and Rochester and across the river to my east, I'm in St. Paul, is the St. Croix River Valley Citizens Group. And there are people who say, we shouldn't be displaced and belittled and marginalized in our own communities. We can welcome people, but here's the deal. They have to change more than we do. That's how it's always been in America. Every immigrant group keeps some of its tradition. I mean, I swear to God, it's now just the non-Irish who drink themselves silly in public during St. Patrick's Day, Devin. You know what I mean? It's oh like, no, it is. I don't. Okay, knock yourself out. I don't. I don't drink, so it's yeah. uh, you know. I stay at home. I stay at home. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. But no, no, and the stomach issues. So yeah. yeah. Well, the, no, but the idea that you have to lose all of your customs and traditions and blend into a cultural Velveeta cheese simply isn't true. But that's how you atomize a people. You destroy the, I mean, yeah. and this is the thing, you know, going back even to our, our discussion about family, but those traditions, uh, those ideas, those beliefs, they give you a roadmap for, you know, how to live your life. They present to you that here, here are the things that are good, here are the things that are bad, and you can judge your life against these standards. You also have the bond of community around you. And then the most important factor is family. And this one is, you know, you see it from libertarians, conservatives, socialists, all over the map. I would wager that most Americans, if asked, what's the foundation of a good society, they will say the individual, when in reality, family is the foundation of it. And right. to your point, John, when it's being destroyed and carved up and demolished, as the family goes, so goes the nation. Amen. We can see where things are going. Amen. It's the primacy of the family can't be overemphasized. And all of the confusing, disparate things that are going on can be made cognizable when you understand the end goal of 
all of them by hook or by crook, a little over here, a little over there, is the destruction of the traditional family. And you can't even say there's two genders. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. And, and people have to have enough belief in themselves, in them, in, in, in their, their wife or their husband to say, this is, the family is the enemy. The family is the enemy. The family didn't ask for it. The family is confused by it. The family doesn't want to hurt anyone or do anything. It's, it's not enough just to be left alone. They will not leave us alone. And so it's common one way or the other. And people have to apprehend that. It's not a, it's not a cause for panic or worrying at night, but the stakes couldn't be higher because societies rise and fall, to your point, Devin, on the strength of the family. Sorry. No, I, I completely agree with you. And the thing that, you know, I'd mentioned that being nice earlier. And, you know, I, my parents got divorced when I was a kid. My mom, uh, she cleaned houses. She worked her tail off, all of these things. And I was an only child. And my father died also uh, when I was young. But I know what that life is like. I mean, I have the utmost uh, respect for my mom just because I know uh, being a dad now, I just know the pressures that we're on and the hard work and all of these things uh, that I saw, but it's not the best. And in this, this be nice morality, we are telling people, mothers who have, I don't know, four or five kids from a couple of different men, uh, hey, you just do you. Don't worry about it. You know, I'm going to be nice. Oh, that's great. No. Great. What about the kids? We know sociologically, it is overwhelming evidence that it harms the kids and their spiritual, their mental right. their, uh, right. development. Right. Uh, you got the anxiety, depression, yeah, no, I, propensity I to drugs and violence, I all agree. of these things. Let, let, me, let me end on this note and try to wrap that up. On okay. Things. I might be introducing two things and we could talk about them uh, another time. Tucker Carlson said, I don't know how long ago, a year could be two, you know how time is in 2020. Was it yesterday or three weeks ago? I can't keep up. No, I, I have no idea. Was it 10 days ago that Trump reported he tested positive? I mean, it's just life at the speed of Trump is how I put it. But now with 2020, we've got all these other elements. Tucker Carlson said, if an economic system doesn't allow his children to get a good education, I mean a real one, not like microaggressions in gender studies, but a... a, a real education that allows them to be employable, to get married and to buy a house, then he has to question the value of that economic system. No matter how conservative Inc. wants to say my free markets, well, my free markets just got the New York Post story about Hunter Biden booted off of Facebook and booted off of Twitter. And we've let that happen. We haven't done a dang thing. But there's an- well, I think too there, that we, there, there, we have our priorities wrong. Well, you know, okay, we, let, me, let me just finish. Yeah, go, go, go. Sorry, the, the point I'm trying to say is that I think for the right, or at least we should be discussing this, if we want to succeed in tangible ways, we need a message of economic populism and we need nationalism. And the economic populism is uh, very much um, anathema to the uniparty. They're corporatists, they're globalists. And I happen to see a firing line from the 60s with Bill Buckley, of course, who hasn't aged well in terms of, of these sorts of things. And of all people, George Wallace. And Buckley took George Wallace to task for Alabama taking care of destitute people 70 years and older. He said the private sector can do that. The, the, the philanthropy can do that. And, he, and, and, and George Wallace said, but they haven't stepped up. I'm the governor, what am I supposed to do? Let them live in punery and destitution. And by the way, 75% of them are African-Americans. Are you saying that I should ignore them because they're, I mean, he put the shoe on the other foot. It's that outmoded thinking that we have to have this free market, which doesn't exist. It's, it's been, you know, derailed a long time ago. An economic system should work for the family is my point. And 
if it really works, guess what? There's a lot of women who go to those cubicles when you could go to a cubicle who would in a heartbeat be at home raising their children and they would not feel subordinate to their husband. They would not feel like a second class citizen or inferior. Are you kidding? People who say that have no idea the powers of a wife and a mother, none. Oh, and Camille, Camille, My Camille, wife is amazing. I, Camille, I just... Camille, Camille Paglia has written about that extensively. Um, and she's a lesbian for the love of God. I mean, just you can get these truths from a lot of different sources. And so an economic system that works for families is essential if we're to preserve them. That's my only point. We have to have an economic system for the family. Well, and I would just add to that, that the this free marketeer limited government has become in some sense an ideology. It, it What has happened is that we it, conservatives, libertarians and others, they, they have put at the very top as if the end of our society is the free market. That is not the end of society. That is not what the highest goal of our government and our people, our communities should be. It is to your point. Uh, free enterprise is a powerful tool, but it's a tool to be able to support the foundation of the society. So no, you're, and I'd actually recommend too to people, if you want to, uh, if you want to read a very different Pope, uh, look up Pope Leo the 13th, and read Rerum Novarum on capital and workers, and you will, it will blow your mind. It is yeah, a fantastic yeah, document. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's, it, it, it never went out of style. Sometimes it's read more than at other times, but that, that's an excellent recommendation. I think what we're both saying, Devin, and jump in if, I'm, if I've got it wrong, I don't think so though, I listen carefully. You do. An economic system should work for us. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be at the disposal of an economic system. The, the tail shouldn't wag the dog. No, no. And, you know, coming up bottom of the hour, so we unfortunately have to wrap up, even though, you know, Scott and others would probably freak out, but I'd say we could go for another couple hours easily. But, uh, you know, to your end, it is, to, or to your statement, give us a sense of your you know, what do things look like? And, and if you want to throw in for the election, so be it, but more so, what does the next decade look like? To, I'm with you. I don't see this postmodernism or post postmodernism lasting very long. You know, the, the foundation of it is sheer, causes sheer chaos when everybody tries to be like God and refuses to acknowledge reality. But what do you say? What does it look like over the next decade for us as people and, and as a country? Yeah, and, and, and for families. I, I, think, I, I think the left is just about played out. Mm. It, it's so contrary to human nature, their various agendas. It's so contrary to common sense and lived experience, which is usually a phrase you hear on the left, but it's, it's not a bad one used judiciously. And I think the, the, the left has been described as a coalition of the fringes. Mm -hmm. And I think there's going to be uh, increased fraying uh, in, uh, that we'll see on the left. And there has to be a retrenchment. There has to be normal people saying, I don't care what they call me. I'm the normal one, you're a little curious. I don't have to have all of these cultural blandishments uh, passed off as authentic. There's no future there. There's, there's, there's not good mental health. There's not good physical health. Uh, life is short and people want um, in America still safe communities, good schools, good jobs, and, and hopefully a solid marriage with children, or not. But, but, but that, I think, will have to reassert itself. It's just that the ramparts, to use a Marxist phrase, the ramparts have been co-opted by this radical cultural left, and they're raining down all this stuff upon us. But like being called a racist for no reason, and thereby devaluing utterly the term racist, all these other things lose their, um, their impact. And I think we'll be coming out of that 
and there'll be a period of retrenchment in the next decade that people will discover, actually, I get more out of loving somebody else than myself. No, I, I, I value I, out of visiting the sick and the shut-in or my grandmother. Yep. No, and, and we are we are unfortunately hitting the bottom of the hour, Goodbye. and are about to go rocketing past it into our second hour, and then you better wrap third up hour. Or Scott's going to be mad at us. Yes, he, he there's a panic breaking out. So, yeah. no, well, John, I think me, those are very me, good me, last me, words. Well, um, if you want to read more, yeah, uh, I'm at minnesotaconservatives.org. I don't write as much as I used to, quite frankly, Devin, because I'm not trying to sound arrogant. I, I've written about everything at least once. I don't want to rewrite for the sake of, of you know having something new. And so the archives could be pretty uh, pretty interesting for people. It's split roughly equally between culture and politics. And the response I get is, and it's indirect, but I've heard it so much that um, being Irish Catholic, I'll overcome my aversion to self-promotion. I tend to say things that a lot of other people are just thinking. Well, then, then that's my lane, again, because I can say it and I'm bulletproof. I can't be doxxed, I'm not anonymous, and I can't be made unemployable. So, you know, there, there are people out there doing different things. You and the Charlemagne Institute are one of them, and I thank you, and I thank Scott Nitzel and all the others at the first Tuesday's conservative group for, for having me on for this discussion. It's been very enjoyable. It has, definitely. And thank you, John, for your time. Uh, for those of us who have been joining us, uh, maybe not heard everything, that was John Gilmore, author and commentator on politics and culture. Uh, this has been a first Tuesday uh, episode for the countdown to the election co-hosted by Alpha News and Charlemagne Institute. Charlemagne Institute, uh, we publish Intellectual Takeout as well as Chronicles Magazine. You can join us if you like, uh, it would be fantastic. You'll get a free 12 month subscription to Chronicles and you will find a lot of discussions that track along with this uh, in there. Yeah, we've got another great lineup tomorrow. Sign up for our emails, you'll get those. And thank you again. And just keep the faith, keep the faith, have courage, continue moving forward. Godspeed.